So welcome back everyone to day two. Uh, for those of you who are joining us new, welcome. Uh, we will do a full sort of update in terms of sort of what the whole challenge is. I would recommend if you have joined us for the uh, first time today to, to access our recording uh, from yesterday, but just very briefly, um, I'm Artish, uh, founder of Gamotech. I'm joined here with Melissa uh, and Maria from the foundation. We've got also a couple of other colleagues from, from the Asfari Foundation, including Abed, Mo, et cetera. So they will be sort of floating around so trying to help um, in some of the activities that we are there. So we've got a full turnout from the foundation. Um, in terms of uh, today, we will be focusing on learning and educational technologies. Um, so this is the learning event. These seven days are part of the learning event as part of the digital challenge. Uh, after which this, there will be a challenge prize as well, which Maria talked about yesterday on the, the webinar. Uh, the rules of which are on the website, uh, on, on the Facebook group, on, on Kaya, etc. So do, do go check those out if you are planning to apply for the prize. In case it was not clear, there are actually seven prizes available, I think. Maria, am I correct? You are correct. There are seven prizes of oh, 7,000 pounds each. Okay, this is a lot of seven. So the seven days, seven K, and the seven prizes. Okay, just to it's be. It's a lucky number. Okay, good. Um, everything, as I mentioned, uh, it will be on the Kaya course. I will actually show the Kaya course today too. So the recording already from yesterday is there. Um, great to see all the lovely faces again. Do use your video if you can. Um, we'll keep you muted for the first part of the session. Keep the chat, um, uh, use the chat window for asking questions. Melissa will keep an eye out and stop me uh, if, I, if I ramble on too fast or you have questions, so, uh, please, please do use it. We, we want to keep these sessions as uh, useful for you as informal, so don't, don't feel that you, yeah, don't, don't wait to ask questions. Um, the, the sessions are being recorded except the breakout room so what you speak what what you sort of talk about there uh, where you complain about us i said this yesterday too uh, that's not on the recording so so just the, what's in the in the bigger in the bigger group uh, and then at the end of every day there's a reflection piece so today also we'll be looking at learning and and, and your reflection there um, and yeah we'll, we'll adjust the, the the activities but i think again we've got a good group size today where we can make the sessions quite interactive so we're really looking forward to some engaging interactive discussions. So jumping straight in then to today, so we are looking at the future of learning slash education. Um, we are, I'll, I'll talk uh, briefly about some future uh, technology trends in the education space, including uh, chatbots, games. I've written virtual reality, actually, we have a separate session for virtual reality next week, so apologies. Uh, and I will share links for all of that with you so that you can try out some of these yourself. Uh, some of the links for these experiences are already on the Kaya page. Um, we will share a few practical learning tools that you are able to access, including the Asfari portal uh, on Kaya. Uh, we, will, we will sort of show you how to play a game on staying motivated while working remotely for those of you who are still working remotely or would like to stay connected with, with a colleague or friend um, through, this, through this interesting game. Uh, and then our creation from today will be a future-proof learning strategy. So hopefully some of the trends you see from today, you are able to apply them to your own context, to the own problems you see around education and learning, and uh, you can use those to build your own sort of future-proof digital learning strategy. So like yesterday, I want to first hear from you in terms of what does learning mean so i am going to start by again pasting the mentimeter link into the chat window uh, and i am going to bring that up so i'm keen to hear in one to two words what does learning mean for you before i go and sort of share some of the trends i'm going to bring that up uh, if you prefer you can also use the chat window but it'd be nice to if you can use the um the Mentimeter link I just shared. So we have some interesting early ones showing up there. Experience was the first one and gr growth and experience of the first ones, knowledge, new skills, 
fun games, impact, very important one, culture, new knowledge. development unknowing there's a there's another word i've also heard which is called unlearning so sometimes we've been we've been taught some things the wrong way or we have to unlearn some of our, our old uh, habits or uh, old experiences it's an interesting one um opening to new opportunities changing for the better these are really really good so it's, it's really so i think most of us agree then is that there is clearly knowledge capture there so it's not just about knowledge uh, but it's about all of these things about growth impact especially the experience i really like the experience has really come up there because quite often learning focuses too much on the knowledge aspect only but not enough on practice experiences so really great um, to see all this coming back and you can see a lot of things like challenges and lessons learned and games and culture and so there's this whole range of these things which which makes up what mean what what learning is for for a lot of us thank you so much for engaging and continue to add these there as with yesterday i will take a snapshot uh from this uh and post it on face group uh, and as I said, this is sort of, yeah, the Mentimeter tool that I'm using. So it's really useful way again for capturing uh, inputs uh, from the group. Uh, just uh, Maria, was there anything that you wanted to add or Abed uh, on, on, um, on the Mentimeter outputs? I mean, I love lifelong process and living. I think that, that really stands out for me. I'd be so, I'm really curious to see what our, participants um, come up with in the breakout sessions. Maybe this will be part of what we talk about. Excellent. Yeah, and it's a really nice segue into the lifelong, I think the lifelong process is, is gonna be sort of one of the key themes I talk about as, as we look at learning, because in addition to sort of technology, I think that's gonna be one of the key, key themes in terms of a continuous aspect of it. So whilst what I'm talking today about is mainly focusing on adult learning and lifelong learning, I did want to bring out this staggering sort of in, uh, statistic, which is actually even, it's a bit old now, but the, the, the education need in terms of the impact that, that COVID has had on primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, and as well as tertiary level. So it's, it's had a huge, huge impact. And you can see that that a number of education systems at all levels, as well as adult learning are, are really are really clearly impacted uh, by by the, the the distancing and the closure of schools. So just it's it's just a very sort of and then the, if you look at the billions, it's, it's quite a, and I think the numbers have even shifted in the in the high direction. So it's something for us to really sort of keep at the back of our mind as we think of education in this um, in this sort of new world. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the, these, these trends here around modularization, continuous learning, nano degrees and credentials. I'll talk a little bit about, um, about sort of in, in immersive experiences. As I said, there's a separate session we're running uh, next week on that. And then artificial intelligence and education and, uh, and, and game-based education. And I'll also sort of give some examples of humanitarian um humanitarian development examples of where a lot of these have been applied so that you don't see this is something that only happens again in silicon valley but it's happening also in in the in the, in the sort of uh in the social impact space as well so the, the first one of these is that that learning and it's ties to ties to the 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 piece that came out from the mentimeter was that learning is becoming much more modular which means it's building blocks you don't necessarily have to do one two-year degree only or a one-year certificate program you can do a one week program or one hour program it could be bite size like the sessions we are running now are bite size so you can attend for one hour learn something from it hopefully apply it but you're constantly learning learning is not uh, is not something that that stops and i think this is definitely a theme linking to our yesterday's discussion on all the trends we are seeing around artificial intelligence and automation that we need to continue to keep learning um, and in response to, to that, that sort of theme, you are seeing already a few years ago, a number of universities uh, creating initiatives like edX, Coursera. Uh, again, all of these links are posted also in, in the Kaya course. Um, 
with with sort of a, an effort to democratize uh, the course materials, uh, learning uh, opportunities for for larger numbers of people. So where ten thousand people at a time can can go and join a course. Uh, in, in most cases, the courses are free. In some cases, you need to pay a small amount for a certification or a diploma. So that sort of ties into the micro credentialing piece. Um, and so that's coming from the more on the left side. That's coming from the more let's say traditional universities on the right side you're seeing actually now initiatives like udacity which are saying okay we don't need to sort of take the old university model we're actually working with the employers what is it that google what is it that facebook what is it that these the new technology companies need in terms of skills today in the marketplace let's create the skills or create the courses that are needed today in the marketplace work with the same employers to run the programs, the educational programs. And then even when the students are joining these programs, they can see actually what a salary could be expected for if they were to complete that program and get a job. So you're trying to close the loop between what the market job market needs and what you're training people for. Because in the traditional model, you train people on something and you hope for the best that, that what they are trained on is needed still in the marketplace. Um, in, in, in the economy and, and then hope they get a job. Um, so I think that you're seeing initiatives which are trying to tie the skills piece much more closely to, uh, to what is actually needed. And Udemy is doing something more similar, uh, similar but, but where anyone can offer courses, not just sort of the sort of bigger uh, educational providers. So you're, you're definitely seeing this as a theme over say, the last 10 years almost. Yesterday I talked about artificial intelligence quite broadly. Uh, Today, in terms of the education space, you're seeing it again being applied for very simple things like toys. So this Cogni toys is this little cute dinosaur, which costs, I think about $100 now, or maybe it's a bit cheaper. But it's, it's essentially tapping into the billion dollars of investment that IBM has done with IBM Watson, uh, which is a very powerful AI engine. And it allows kids to ask it questions and tell it stories. So you should check out some of the videos on Cogni toys. But it's essentially a little talking dinosaur. But it's taking the, the the AI. It's taking is from something very sophisticated. So the point here is that AI is becoming much more accessible for educate educators. But to do very simple things. So the chatbots example here again is supporting um, people to uh, who are enrolling in a course, and they want some very have some very common questions about when the course is starting or what kind of what kind of course materials they need. So I don't think at the moment AI is there yet in education where it can definitely not replace a teacher in the sense, but and, and provide very sophisticated um, um, reflection and, and coaching. But what it can do, it can take off the burden from the teachers and trainers in terms of a lot of administration, in terms of some of the common knowledge aspects that we covered uh, in the Mentimeter. So knowledge, administration, following up with students, these are things where artificial intelligence is having a, is already having quite a wide impact uh, today. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about game-based learning, and this is coming from our Melissa's and my personal experience with Gameoteca, and where we've also sort of seen this challenge uh, of e-learning, particularly uh, where people are faced with a choice between very well connected participatory face-to-face -face learning or e-learning which tends to be self-guided so you're by yourself and doing an e-learning e course and we were seeing how can you bring more of that human connection which especially now we are so lacking and we want to create more connection rather than having people go uh, get more sort of separated and more, more apart so that's sort of our, our core goal with Gamerteca. And this came out of some research that we did when I was at the U United Nations. Um, we started with some sort of serious games, looking at security training, and then we came more towards sort of green behaviors and gender bias and coaching. And as of last year, Gameoteca is an open platform that anyone can use both for playing and creating games. So I've been posting as well on Facebook, do try out some of the games both as a player and at the end of the session i'll also show you how you can go create your own games and publish your own games so you can take the coaching game adapt it and use it for your own context as well so it is a collaborative platform for trainers uh, to create and publish micro learning experiences so small pieces of learning 
uh, that you can do between learners where you can mix what you're doing in the real world and on the mobile device. Uh, and you can bring in some gamification elements of so things like a, a score, a badge, a level, et cetera. So we're trying to make this whole, this whole possibility to create these kinds of games very easy for trainers. And then there is an app which I encourage you to download. So as a learner, you go and play the, you can then go play those games. So we're trying to make not just the playing of the games easy, but we're trying to make the creation of the games uh, easy as well through the, through the platform. Uh, and I'll just very quickly walk you through how you can sort of create games. So if you log in to, once you've played the game, if you go on to gamotheca.com and you, you log in, you can then get some templates. Uh, so this is the game on design thinking where you can choose the roles that you have. Uh, so here there's a player one and two, could be a coach or a coachee. Uh, and then you can define what the player is seeing on the screen, but you can also more importantly, define what they do. So whether they're uploading something, whether you're getting them to share a video or a reflection of something that they've done in real life. So it's really encouraging sort of bringing in elements from what they do not on the phone, but they, 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 they do in, in real life. Uh, and then you can test this out to see how the game looks before you, you publish it. So it really encourages a sort of mixed reality sort of game flow. And there's a lot of help articles Melissa will also post in the forums that you can access. If you get stuck, um, that we, I think Melissa has created a lot of videos. There's a lot of help articles that you can, can access. Once you've created your games, then you can publish the games so that, that participants can join either through um, an LMS. So Kaya, for example, the Aspari portal is an, a learning management system where players can join by themselves. So this can be done at scale. Or you can create custom games where you as a trainer are saying, I want to train these 20 people and I invite exactly sort of Maria and Abed and Melissa together in one team and I can create sort of different, uh, um, uh, let's say, customized sessions based on, on, the, on the team that I want. So all, you, can, you can do this as well through the system and then you are able to publish it. So this is a link on the Kaya page where we've created a game on challenging gender biases. And, and then you can sort of invite people and they get a game code that they're able to join with. So I'll show you finally how this looks like for the players. So you, a, a few of you have already downloaded the app. So if you download it from Android or the Apple stores, uh, you can then, once you've joined the game in the browse, uh, you can then invite your, um, you can invite someone else to play with you. Uh, so it could be a colleague or a friend. They then join with that game code. Uh, and then what happens is what you receive, you both receive a notification, but importantly, what learner one is doing now. So let's say learner one is uploading something from the camera that can then be viewed by learner two. Let's say this is uh, a, a user persona they've created. So that that's gone to the learner, to the second learner. And then the, lear the second learner can then comment on that and that the comment can then go back to the first learner. So you're really creating sort of this, this, these interactions between the two players. So this is a game on design thinking, uh, which is also accessible on Gameoteca. So if, once you go in there, you can you can browse and 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 you can join it and and learn about design thinking. We'll cover design thinking, I think, on the last day seven. Uh, and this is a useful complement uh, if you are interested in in design thinking. And and finally, just in terms of analytics, I think this is it's also important for people to learn about how players are actually interacting. So you can see how the different teams are interacting with the games. You can then get some statistics in terms of how many people are completing and you can provide feedback as well. And so we're doing a lot of other exciting stuff on Gamoteca. So do keep an eye out, um, including localization. So we are working sort of on more Arabization as well of the platform. We already, already support right to left, but we're also trying to make more capabilities which will make it work uh, in, in, in Arabic. But there's a lot, lot of other capabilities as well which are coming there. So that's a little bit on Gamoteca because I think it's a useful way where we've been looking at a lot of these trends and trying to incorporate those into our startup. But I want to share a few other examples as well of types of innovative learning. I mentioned chatbots. So this is an example of how when I was working at the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, we started using chatbots to promote and help users discover courses that were available. 
because the academy had over half a million followers on Facebook. Uh, they had over 500 courses and sometimes these users would come and they would, they would say, okay, what course is there for me? So the chatbot could help the users uh, discover what courses were, use, were suitable. So you could say, okay, I'm a staff member and I'm interested in leadership and it could say, okay, these are the courses that we have for you in leadership. Um, so it's an interesting way of helping people discover new content. Um, we also created some uh, chatbots to create a bit of micro learning journey uh, where you could have a, you could start the, the learning, a little video, a little quiz on a chatbot on Facebook directly before they started the full full blown course. So that was something quite interesting. And we were using we were using Google Dialogue Flow, which is an engine that you can use. You don't need to be a developer to do it, but there are simpler chat engines in that called Chat. Uh, chat fuel. So again, we'll share all these links, um, which is trying to make the creation of chatbots very simple, even if you are not very technical or, or a developer. Um, so uh, Melissa, maybe you can put a link uh, from the Academy sort of page on chatbots in, in, the, ch uh, in the chat window. Um, so people can try out some of the, the chatbot yeah. experiences. Atish, before, yeah. you, before you, you go to the next slide, do you think you could just give us a really quick example of how, let's say, a civil society organization might be able to use a chatbot in its work? Sure. Um, so most websites these days are incorporating chatbots also onto their website itself. So if, let's say, you are a civil society organization working, I saw a lot of organizations focusing on mental health, for example. Um, so it could, uh, when you go to the website, you go to the Facebook page, it could already it could already sort of offer you some kinds of sort of common questions in terms of what the organization does, what are some of the common resources. So you can say, what resources do you have on mental health? And the chatbot could come up with some resources on uh, that it could offer. Actually, around mental health as well, there has been I, I also shared a few links. Uh, there's a lot of interesting use of chatbots for mental health, and it seems quite counterintuitive that people would want to talk to a chatbot when they're dealing with mental health. But actually, a lot of people, the research showed a lot of people were more comfortable sometimes opening up to a non-human being, uh, especially some of in the early days, um, rather than a, a person in some cases. So again, there are different applications. So it's, I would say for in a very simple, simple way, uh, it's, it's about discovering sort of what resources are available. It takes also a lot of effort. I think sometimes these teams, the civil society organizations are very small. And so we noticed also with the academy to have um, a small co communication team. It's very difficult to answer everyone's questions on, on social media. So it's, it's also a really useful way to automate some of those common responses into what resources do you have? When is your next mental health workshop? So you can very easily create these types of uh, interactions through a, through a chatbot on Facebook and on your website. Uh, and you can also, they can also work on things like WhatsApp or Telegram, or they, they tend to be cross-platform as well, which is can quite chat helpful. Bots also be, my last question, but can chatbots also be used for things like research and polling? Yeah, so you can also use them for, for that. I, I know that during the one of the elections here, um, you could use a chatbot to discover who your, by putting in your postal code in the UK to discover who your local, let's say, MP was, or, or the candidates were standing, and you could it could sort of you could uh, find out more about about them. Um, it can be used for polling as well, so you can integrate polling mechanisms as well. You can build in a survey monkey poll, for example, into into chatbot as well. Thank you. There's one Thanks, last Maria. question. I feel like there's a bit of confusion of what a chatbot is. So maybe if you could just do like a quick summary of, of sure. what it actually is. Yeah. So a chatbot is essentially when you go into, let's say, Messenger uh, or into iMessage or any type of messaging app application where you're when you're typing, normally you're speaking to a person. What a chatbot does is it, it it is not really a person at the other end, so it's trying to automate what another person at the other end is saying. Um, so uh, let me see if I can actually bring up. So Melissa, you shared an example, I think of. Uh, I'm just gonna put the example that Melissa put in the chat window. So these were some of the chatbots, um, let's say on coaching and mentoring. So I'm gonna open this. So this takes you to Messenger. So 
Um, and then here I'm just using, let's say, button-based interactions uh, to, to chat. But you could also use text in some cases. You could also type in. So it really looks like you are you feel like you're actually speaking to a person, but actually you are speaking to a chatbot. So just automating what a person in a, in a, would be interacting with in one of these messenger applications like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, etc. Great. So in terms of game-based learning, I covered a lot of that through um, through the Gamateka presentation, but um, Melissa, maybe you can also share some of the links for the humanitarian games that we've created. So what we did was with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, we created a number of games on coaching and mentoring, uh, on onboarding, on design thinking, challenging gender biases. So uh, Melissa will share these as well in chat windows that you can access. But the goal here was again, to scale human engagement in learning in a humanitarian context. What was also really exciting for us was that games like the gender bias game, for example, was created not by us, but it was created by a local organization in Jordan that was working on toxic masculinity in the region. So it was looking at at games which are not were created by local civil society organizations as well. So again, that's why having a simple platform to create their own games was a good way for these organizations to create the games. And then we were able to publish them on a wider platform. So this is how we were able to integrate sort of game-based learning through Gamateka for, for a wider uh, audience. So finally, I would just like to sort of share a few practical tools. So I've mentioned Kaya a few times. Um, I'll bring up um, here the Aspari portal very briefly. So uh, Maria, feel free as well to, to, say, uh, to share anything, but essentially this is the, um, so firstly, I'd encourage you to go to Kaya and si kayaconnect.org and sign up. So I'll uh, put the link in the chat window here. Um, and then make sure you do go to the, the challenge page as well. So all of the materials that I mentioned, we are posting in this page. Um, so I'll show you, for example, we have all the links to the, the, the webinars, uh, the Facebook community, We've already put the recording from yesterday here and a number of other sort of resources I mentioned yesterday. Uh, so this is one of the courses that's in the Aspari portal, uh, but I think there are quite a few other resources as well. Can I jump in quickly since if we're gonna, if we're yeah. gonna I'll say a couple of lines, I think about the portal. Yeah, sure. Just to give people a little bit of a context on it. Is he? All right. yeah. So everybody, the, the portal is essentially the foundation's flagship project. It's one of the ways in which we work to strengthen our region's local civil society organizations and the ecosystem that surrounds them through collaboration around digital knowledge production and online knowledge sharing. So essentially, it is an open access online space. It aims to democratize access to learning for local organizations and to showcase to donors and to other key actors, you know, what our region's civil society organizations and social entrepreneurs are really doing, like the contribution you are making to your communities. And to make it possible for you to share knowledge and collaborate in ways that can really strengthen the sector in our region. So what Atisha has just shown you on the screen, um, Practically, what it means is that this platform is one that you're going to be able to use both to take online courses that are relevant to your work as civil society organizations of the region and use the tools on the portal to create your own content that captures your knowledge, that captures your expertise, your models, your best practices, so that you can showcase them and share them and evolve them. And all of this is to help strengthen your organization's impact and your influence locally, but also regionally and globally. So right now, what you're looking at on the screen, it's, it's a prototype. It's, it's, uh, the Osprey portal is still a baby. It's in test phase, and we expect to launch it towards the end of the year. But for those of you who are planning to compete in the challenge, we're going to aim to feature your submissions fully credited to you on the portal so that you and others can access them because, well, because knowledge is, it's the currency of our sector and of the future. And what you submit from digital output to digital strategies, we're gonna consider all of that learning content, you know, knowledge that you are developing and that can be shared with others, which makes each of you a producer of knowledge in your own right. 
So Thanks. yeah, that's the portal. Please stay tuned for that. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Maria. So yes, so do 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 stay tuned. And and uh, the the page that we just shared now is just the first of many resources. Although that's a resource that we've created, as Maria said, we want to see content that you are creating, not that we are creating. So uh, so we're looking forward to seeing your content there. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I've shared the link as well to to the the resources. I think we're posting everything on Facebook, but it get it gets quite confusing after a while. So the Kaya page is a good way to have all the resources broken down by days and all of the additional resources that you also share on Facebook. I'll, I'll make sure to post them there. In addition, there are uh, a number of creative learning resources on how to create your own content. So there are resources on instructional design, on creating your own e-learning, on the first steps to design your own courses, on writing, on visual design. So there's a whole range of modules and on resources on creating e-learning um, so again i'll be posting the links uh into the kaya page so that you have access to to these to these uh courses and resources there's also a learning toolkit uh which i will signpost to which is on learning methodologies uh on creating communities uh, of learning on storytelling on there's a lot of terms here which i'm not going to get into all of them but it's how do you create what you'd normally create in a face-to-face -face setting, a community of learners, but how do you try to take some of that and digitize it? Uh, so there's a lot of very interesting videos and resources, et cetera, which I'd strongly encourage you to, when you have a chance to, to, use, to read them. They're all very bite-sized, five minutes each, so you don't have to do it all in one go, but I'd encourage you to, to, to look at some of them as well. And finally, I mentioned Coursera, Udacity, LinkedIn Learning. During COVID, a number of these providers who normally would charge let's say linkedin learning is also making a lot of the resources available for free so also keep an eye out on some of these these uh, places i will signpost again or link to some of these resources which are available for uh, for free as well uh, on facebook and within kaya so there's a number of very practical learning resources that are there so before we go into our group discussion, I just want to sort of have this sort of fine moment here to talk about like what is sort of the future of education and and and, and are, are we looking at sort of a future where you know we are just able to download it into into our computer or into our brains as some of you you alluded to to yesterday. So we're again going to now go into our uh, into groups. So I think there's about 25 of us. So I'll again do about five groups. Um Keen to sort of see from you what what is what does the future of learning look like for you? You've seen some examples of digital learning now from me. You know of some other examples as well. What does it look like for your workplace, for your organization? It's possible some of you are also focusing on education in the sense that of, of your, your children or your students. Uh, so, uh, so you could even think of it from that context as well. So I'd say take about 15 minutes in the groups I'm going to again share, similar to yesterday, a Jamboard link um, that you can use. I'd suggest start. I think there's not too many of us. You could start on the same page. If you run out of space, you can click on this button on the right here to add more post-its. But why not we all uh, just use the post-its and, and add, add them to the first one. And if you run out of space, then go to the next page. So I'm going to paste the link now into the chat window so make sure you open up the the future classroom um jamboard um and the people like from the, the other facilitation team will be will be moving around as well so do if you don't already know each other do introduce yourselves obviously first to to uh to each other and um then yeah i would, I would suggest yesterday Maria, I don't know if you want to add anything. I, I noticed yesterday when you were in the group, in the groups, it's nice if one of you takes a role of uh, being the scribe. So, you know, sharing, you can even share your own screen uh, and you could be the one who's leading and the others are sort of speaking. And so there's someone who's, who's, who's putting the, the post-it notes uh, onto the room. So let's take about 15 minutes. I'm going to break us into five rooms. Um, and we'll come back in 15 minutes and do a bit of a debrief then. See you all soon. So what I would suggest is, uh, so I've, I've uh, given you permissions now, you can also unmute yourself. So why don't we take a few comments from the group because there's been some really good, good ideas which have come about. So um, why don't we, yeah.
take a take a few comments. Anyone willing to go first? Yes, I have Hunda, Hunada. Sorry, you have to unmute yourself, another. Oh no, okay, no, you you you're fine. It's not working. Yeah, okay, that's working now. Oh, it's wrong. <laughs> no, it's working. Yeah, uh, no, it's okay. I had someone call me Honda too in the in the group. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the first I have to comment on the like it's never not weird to to be like to be taken from the room. It's like time travel. It's like you're about to be taken somewhere else. Um, we had a, I think an interesting discussion, but we could not like we were I don't know. I think the group, let's raise our hands or something. Our group, Sundus and Majid and Noha. Yeah, so uh, I, we, there's so much in common uh, and uh, like about what is learning for us and also about how we can, uh, how we do our learning currently. And, and to be honest, like uh, in some, in, in some cases, um, some of what you said were uh, already implemented by uh, Sundus, for example, and Majid, and also Dua had something similar. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, I'm speaking for everyone. Uh, I said I didn't apply similar stuff in our work, but we were looking forward to actually connect more uh, and learn more. This is very generic, but I think our group is happy to take answers. <laughs> Um, right. Question. And, and just just with, with your permission, I think there's this discussion is going in really interesting places. So with your permission, I think we'll go 10 minutes over the hour. Uh, so I hope that is OK. I, I hate to close off a really interesting conversation. So if, if that's OK, if you can't, I understand. So any any other sort of anyone wants to build on another's sort of comments from the team? Yeah, I think uh, Sanders. You need to, you, you want me to unmute you? Yeah, there you go. Hello. So as uh, Hunada mentioned, we talked about uh, learning and what uh, does learning mean for, for us. So we're talking, we talked about to be open to each other and uh, it's a daily process. It's not something that uh, it happens once. And uh, like we talked also about working on Hakinimi and Majd being from different backgrounds that we trust each, trust each other. We learn from each other. And we started to talk also about uh, like one of the things how um, we try like to achieve this through the company. So we started to document like each tiny detail. And uh, so we started to talk about uh, documentation and uh, like it must be like suitable for each person based on his background because maybe he's working on finance. So he will document something that uh, I'm not familiar with. So he has to do it like in a specific way that I can do understand this. And it was a deep discussion. We didn't want to uh, just to get over. I can add to that. I mean, the last the last point that we were making before you stole us back to the main session, Atish, was we were talking about how we've received lots and lots in the past. We've received like massive documents that you have to plow through. And it's all about, you know, people in organizations need to share information with each other. And we need to share information with, you know, the communities that we work with outside of the organizations. But a lot of the time we get that information in like big handbooks or giant PDFs. So people don't necessarily have time to read them or want to read them or can absorb all of that information. And we were just starting to get into how like the format of that information is a huge role in terms of how many people are actually going to get that information and take it and absorb it. If you present it in a way that makes it fun and interesting and interactive and accessible, people will really absorb it. They'll learn from it. And that's kind of why, you know, like sort of framing around the, the learning stuff that you're talking Maria, we're losing you a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to jump in there. So I think uh, what you're sharing in terms of the, you know, the dense materials and, and, and I think that's the, we see that in a, a very practical example I can give is how pilots are trained. So pilots get these massive manuals for, you know, how a plane is run. But the way a pilot actually learns to fly a plane is not just by knowing all the theory about the plane. They also have to actually practice 
flying a plane in a simulator. So I think it's a practice-based part. Also, sometimes we focus our learning so much on the PDFs and the knowledge, we forget about the practice of, of how we work with our beneficiaries or how we work with different partners. Organized. So I think that aspect of the learning is also really important. That, that simulator yeah. part of the learning is, is, is as important. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, there's do I, do I want to also comment? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, I'll mute you. Yeah, exactly. I want to I want to stress on this practice side. I was sharing with my group that at our organization, we do test do. So we always have this experimental learning. We learn through experimenting things. And what makes this like successful is that we are comfortable to make to make some mistakes. The leadership doesn't make us feel so stressed and like uh, there are no mistakes and so on, which makes everything on the long run, uh, on the long ride better. The results are like 100% better. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was Edison who said there's no failure. There's just, you just learned another way of not doing certain things a certain way. So I think it's failing forward and, and doing practicing and failing in a safe way is how you're learning how things shouldn't be done so i think it's a really really good good point uh, any any other comments from the group um i think i may jump in here um a lot of discussions is building on what maria was saying sifting through many uh, pdf pages we talked about simplicity of kind of learning bites uh, to kind of keep it focused keep it concise on one topic and one kind of bite that would make it easier we talked a lot about um, uh, the uh, newer generations are used to technologies and uh, they're, they're much easier at kind of having learning online or like through lifelong learning practices, but they need better guidance uh, in, 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 the, in, in their learning effort. Uh, we talked about that uh, learning requires a lot more preparation, online learning specifically or lifelong learning. You need to prepare much more in advance uh, to give all the information required for all the learners at the same time, and here we mentioned the chatbot uh, could make a good application. So if someone has any questions, um, we talked about a lot. Not, we, not, we talked a lot about uh, the changes of the degrees in the future. It wouldn't like four-year degrees will change. You will be learning different skills and different topics. You wouldn't join university to study pharmacy, for, for pharmaceuticals, to be for example. It would be something else. And the importance of kind of policy change that is required to allow for those new learning modalities or new learning types to take place. Um, and also uh, the one more point was on that has to be um, the new lifelong learning or the future of learning in workplaces. It gives a lot, the employee a lot more flexibility to upskill themselves at their own time, at their own pace. Uh, so it would be much more relaxing in the future. I don't know. Thanks, if, thanks. If thanks the group would like to add anything as well. That's very, very useful. And but anyone else wants to add from from that group? Yes, uh, Ola. Okay. Do you yeah, hear yeah. me now? Yes. Uh, yes. Just to add to uh, the the points Abdurrahman mentioned. Um, we talked a lot about uh, that it, it will be more flexible and more uh, easier to learn, but it needs a lot of preparation before. But we need, we can make it more accessible if there were the right policies to do that, because it should be more flexible in the future because of all of these uh, technologies. But we need to make sure that everyone is also getting the chance to access uh, the learning opportunities. And uh, for the adults becoming, um, having more specific jobs means also that how much they can be paid for other kinds of jobs. If they leave one, uh, one area of working, then how they can be developed in other uh, paths of their uh, career. So it's also sometimes there are some challenges, but uh, now maybe it's the time that technologies think of these uh, of solutions for that. Also, in terms of keeping it more human, uh, like uh, not only just, um, I mean, digitalizing everything and just forgetting about the human side of learning, which, which is also a very important uh, part of learning, the human and the aspect uh, and the social aspects. So, yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's very, very good point. Although I just, I posted an article on the digital inclusion barrier. So think of all the people who could not join these Zoom calls because they don't have good enough internet, they don't have a computer, et cetera. So we do have to be conscious about thinking about this, the, the people who will not have access to these types of learning and, and what should we do then to make sure if this is the only way for people to access learning is how do we make sure they have access to the, the right technology or the right bandwidth or the right computers, et cetera. Um, I think on the I think the human and digital is something we can think not as separate concepts. It is possible for people to have a human connection as we are having a face to face conversation now, but we need to encourage more of these conversations because I've seen too many webinars where there's one speaker who speaks like I did for the first half an hour and people just listen and they ask some questions, but we need to encourage more dialogue and and more conversations as well. It's not easy, but I think that we need to uh, we need to encourage more more conversations. Uh, Anas, Mo, Melissa, anything from, from your, your groups? Uh, I wanted to add something as well. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Abdurrahman. Thanks, Atish. Uh, so I just wanted to echo what Ola was saying. This is Tufi from uh, Change Labs. Uh, we, in, in our room, we talked a lot of, about a, a lot of things regarding uh, education, but I think one thing we emphasize is um, uh, ease of, of reach, which is what Ola was saying, right? And uh, for, for it to be more uh, less expensive. I think these are two, uh, and, and this is, I think, an infrastructural changes to not just technology, not just having access to the application, but like you just mentioned, you know, internet access. And sometimes it's not, it's some people don't even know that there are such platforms, applications, webinars taking place. So it's not just infrastructural access but uh, I don't know how to describe it, but I guess knowledge access would, for lack of a better term, you know, that there's the content out there where you can actually go and learn it on your own. Yeah, yeah that's raising, it, thank you. Ra raising awareness, no thank, thanks, uh, Tufik. Yes, um, I think Rana, you have one more follow-up point. Yeah, I just wanted to add to all what they said. Uh, we talked also about the uh, issue of privacy. Uh, when you have uh, a Zoom uh, or uh, any way of uh, online learning and you're sitting inside the house, uh, there's uh, not always the place for you to sit quietly and uh, be able to be to focus. Uh, not always you have the uh, space uh, to sit down and be able to, uh, um, to, to focus uh, in the learning, online learning. Uh, and uh, we shared our experience during the COVID-19 in the uh, organization that we had a lot of times a lot of problems uh, with the young women that couldn't come online because they didn't feel uh, enough uh, uh, safe or they didn't have felt that they have the privacy when they sit in the same place with their um, parents or with their uh, brothers and share things that they used to do when we had the face-to-face -face meetings. 